while we're waiting for him, let me just explain. I'm accelerating the rest of this um, uh, conference a little bit. I'm cutting short the things I wanted to talk about. The reason um, I have Helpful Engineering, OSMS, and um, Cosmic here together is public invention believes the more alliances we can make, the better, as long as we don't constrain ourselves in terms of our um, free libre open source licensing. So we are trying to reach out to universities as much as possible to liaise with universities. Um, Megan, who you're going to hear from later, actually tried to start a public invention and humanitarian engineering club at the University of Texas, but the COVID-19 pandemic shut that down, I'm afraid, and she's now graduated. Um, we also want to work with allied or um, uh, similar organizations. Victoria, are you ready to talk about uh, OSMS now since I don't see Ben here? I am here. Okay, great. So I'm very pleased to have Victoria Jacqua on the board of Public Invention, but she's also a member of a different organization um, that has a very allied purpose, even though they they their style is a little different than public invention, and that is open source medical supplies. Um, they have probably really saved lives, whereas public invention is trying to save lives sort of in an abstract way down the road. OSMS has probably saved lives already. Take it away, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My name is Victoria Jacqua. I am the medical team co-lead for Open Source Medical Supplies. My background is uh, allied health. I'm a cardiac uh, catheterization radiology, radiology technologist. And um, I've been with OSMS since the beginning of March 10th of last year. So our anniversary is coming up. I'm going to share my screen here so OSMS started uh, originally as a discussion point for developing an open source ventilator. And within about three days of that idea, um, our founder, Guy Cavalcanti, who is a robotics engineer by background, had interviews with medical professionals in his uh, social circle. And those people said, what we really need more then ventilators are protective equipment, PPE, that will protect our medical professionals because you can build all the machines that you want, but you cannot create more people who have the skill level that is needed in order to fight COVID. So a bunch of things happened all at the same time with COVID and OSMS really um, hit a lot of different points um, in fighting the pandemic. Here's our first post on March 10th. We were developing a requirements document for um, a ventilator. And if I go way up here, um, we then tried to uh, survey medical professionals to determine what other equipment they would need besides a ventilator. And this um, resulted in interviews. And once again, our only platform is Facebook. This is how we collected information. We built a community of experts. So, um, at the time, remember that we did not know a whole lot about COVID. There wasn't a lot of research um, available in the United States. And there was a lot of um, speculation about how to treat it. Um, not a whole lot of information was coming out from the CDC. So there was a medical supply guide formed that described the basics of what COVID was and how it is treated, what sort of medical um, devices would be used or necessary to treat a COVID patient. So we developed a a series of documents. One was the medical supply guide, basically addressing COVID. And we then went on to develop description for descriptions for what supplies would be needed to fight the pandemic. 
And these uh, developed into supply categories. And this, these documents are still available. And from this, we did um, design requests searching for anyone who had designs for face shields, masks that were open source. And this was back in the day where none of, none of these designs existed. We're middle of March, maybe third week of March, and there was no place to find these designs or a central repository to know who was using what had it tested, validated by any sort of regulatory body. So, and then through, this is a, a post about us looking for facial designs. So fast forwarding a little bit here, from March until about mid end of June, our organization um, amassed about 75,000 members on Facebook and we ran pandemic response with a Facebook group and a set of Google documents. Our supply categories um, collected open source designs that the community was using from all over the world. Joseph Prusa was the first person to get a face shield validated by the Czech, by Ministry of Health over in Czechoslovakia. This design was shared open source, a design that matters, printed it for a uh, infection control department at Harvey Med in Seattle, Washington. They wanted a modification, he did that. They liked it, it got sent over to the VA. The VA liked it, sent over to the NIH and the NIH within eight days of the initial printing, put it up on their website and it caused the servers of the NIH to crash. So we were part of this whole, this whole movement of open source design sharing to help fight, fight the pandemic. And Joseph Prusa um, posted on our uh, Facebook page about the, all the developments. So I talk about the Facebook group and the Google Docs simply because that's all we had. And the Google Docs helped us extract the designs presented on the Facebook group and get them into documents, um, talked about, validated, and be a central repository for people to find a design so they don't have to sift through thousands and millions of uh, Facebook posts and comments to find the design that is actually being used. So in June, we launched our website. And first, I, keep, I want to keep talking about the production. Um, we have been running manual tallies up until, I think, July on the global maker community uh, producing PPE. And of the people that have responded to those tallies and our community impact survey that was put out in August, I believe, we have tracked 48.3 million units of PPE and medical supplies donated or delivered um, at about 268 million estimated replacement value. All of this data is going to be um, submitted in a community impact survey report. If you want to receive that, you can sign up for it. And I'm going to post the link in the chat here. Um, when I get a second, I am no good with tech. Sorry. Um, throughout this, we put our Google documents on a, uh, drop down here, we developed uh, this medical supply guide. Okay. So that is here and it opens up as a Google Doc. We also developed public health guides. One of the most popular is home care. Um, people wanted to know if I get COVID, what do I need to know about taking care of myself or if I have someone at home who's sick. A lot of disinformation was floating around. It's very difficult for the lay person to keep track of what regulatory health body is saying what, updating it, and 
what information should I follow? Because we're battling social media and we're battling um, some healthcare professionals like family physicians who don't think this is a problem at all. At my own hospital, um, there were public health officials saying, you know, this is just the flu and no one needs to worry about it. Um, I remember seeing that around the end of February. So this guide tells you how to take care of yourself if you're sick with COVID, what to expect, basics of home treatment. And this is regularly updated with um, information from the CDC and HHS uh, regulatory bodies like that. The most crowning achievement of OSMS is the project library. This is where all of the open source projects live. They can still be accessed via Google Doc, but they are here on the website. You open up projects. And here are all the different options. 3D printing is very popular, but any sort of fabrication um, is possible. We have a big mass category. Okay, so this provides um, a one stop space for people to find a project that is applicable to PPE mostly. We do have hand washing stations for areas that are low water resource. And some of them are infrastructure based. Uh, everyone making masks, uh, pleated masks, suddenly everyone needed mask pleaters. All right, whoever thought that that would be a thing, but it is now. Uh, infrastructure project that came out was 3D printed bias tape makers because bias tape was sold out of all the stores when people were making masks in the spring. And people needed to make their own bias tape. So the 3D printing community stepped up and created bias tape makers. So all of those uh, designs are here. We have a map of groups associated with OSMS who are registered as uh, chapters or groups that wanna be on the map for makers. We also have a local response guide. One of the first two guides that came out were the medical supply guide teaching people about COVID-19 and the local response guide, how to motivate and organize your community to um, fight the pandemic. So we have a lot of groups here, many of whom are still active. And our community impact report will talk a lot about these. Over on global impact, we have national case studies where we have looked at many different countries, a pandemic response, especially uh, honing in on the maker movement and showcasing the best case uh, scenarios, why they were effective, what the collaborations and um, connections with the community and government were that allow these communities to be effective. Um, how many lives were saved, how many units of PPE were produced, how open source designs helped uh, make this response successful. And this is one of my favorite parts of our um, group. We are highlighting different parts of the world and not just talking about challenges, but actual progress and how these communities help protect each other. All right, I think that's a really quick overview. Um, okay, stop. thank let you me... very much, Victoria. Um, we, we do have a question uh, from Pierre Longchamp. But first, let's hear a hand for Victoria and the work that they've done. Um, you know, I view public invention as attempting to do 
the same thing that OS MS does, but we're just attacking a different piece of the problem in, in the sense that we're trying to build somewhat more complicated devices. Uh, but there's a place for everybody in the COVID-19 uh, effort and in public invention. Um, there's a place for people who just know how to use a sewing machine and can make a mask. And there's a place for mathematicians um, making very sophisticated uh, devices. Um, so Victoria, Pierre Longchamp, who is a uh, medical device regulation expert, uh, ask, have you ever been contacted by any official institution, e.g. the FDA, with concerns about what you were doing? Uh, no, we haven't. Part of our um, standard as a group is to pay attention to FDA EUAs. And a lot of these open source designs fall under FDA EUAs that were issued for face shields, aerosol boxes, um, gowns. The FDA issued those pretty early on in the pandemic. And we are developing a policy document that talks about varied um, challenges that we discovered over the course of the past year. And that's um, informed heavily by some conversations um, we've had with um, people attached to the FDA and, and PA pool with the Office of the Science and Technology Partnership. Um, Dorothy can you know, tell us more about that. But we've been careful to, to uh, really pay attention to those EUAs with the added um, criteria of, we know that we are an international organization. Um, what may be um, an EUA here in the United States might not be an EUA overseas. And one of the big wins for the open source community was Joseph Pruce's face shield did receive CE certification. So okay. um, a lot of other open source face shield designs um, really copied um, at least the the basic structure of his sh face shield because of that progression. Okay. Well, I'm sorry I have to cut you off. I'm afraid I have not done the best time management. I'm going to cut short a lot of my things. Um, right after uh, Philip Edgecombe and Patrick Wilkie present about Cosmic, which is coming up right now, I'm going to make some very brief remarks and then present the awards. So um, this part of the conference will be over about 1.35. We are then going to have a little social hour where people can continue. Um, I know many of the speakers, you may have questions which I have not allowed time to answer. Uh, I, su I suspect most speakers will be willing to answer any questions you have by email if um, you contact them after this. If you don't have contact information for them, just send it to me and I will try to get you in touch with them. Um, one of the very important things about any conference like this is making new connections between um, uh, people. So we certainly want to foster that. And I'm sorry that I have to be a little short with people.